My name is Lucy Quith, and over the years I've had the privilege of spending time with many young people. And one thing I agree on with them is that they want to see a Ghana and an Africa that's different. It's what I call the bold new normal. The new normal that's bold, that has new visions of what is possible in this country and on this continent. You see, to truly change our outcomes, we need to be bold in defining those new visions of normality. We need to be bold in changing how we talk about our future. And those changes in what we say, our language, will impact our mindset and it will make that future possible. It's exactly why I'm embarking on a tour meeting group on what we need to do into that future. Follow me on social media and you will hear more about where these events will be. But more importantly, I will share details of when these events will be live streamed so you can participate from wherever you are. Let's come together. Let's define our bold new normal and let's agree to work on creating the future that you and I know is possible. Join us. Hello again, everyone. Good evening. And I guess we have to say good evening to everyone who's watching um, live. So should we all say a good evening to everyone who's watching? So if we say it loudly enough, they'll hear us. Good evening. Excellent, excellent. What's a wonderful room full of millennials. Who here thinks they're millennial? Oh. Come on, people. I'm a millennial. Millennial isn't a number. For me, being a millennial is about how you interact with the world. I think what really makes a difference between the generations is our engagement with the world around us and with people around us. So I'm a millennial. I may not look it, but um, I think I engage with technology and other things enough to count as a millennial. So this evening, we're going to have a power hour together, right? An hour, a powerful hour. We're going to roll up our sleeves and make sure that we make a difference to what we're doing. So my hope is that tonight you're going to leave here either inspired to start that business that you've been waiting to start for so long and you just haven't gotten around to it, or you're going to take your existing business to a whole new level. One of the two have to happen. That's why we're here tonight. And so tonight we're talking about entrepreneurship, and particularly I'm talking about entrepreneurship in the context of the young or younger or millennial feeling and thinking person, particularly here in Ghana, but for anyone watching around the world, and how the work we need to do, particularly in more disadvantaged locations like some of our countries in Africa that need us to take things to a whole new level really, really quickly. So that's what the bold new normal is about. The bold new normal is about redefining, redefining and creating that new Africa that we want. No, not just a new, new Africa, but something that's bold and different from what we've been used to. And I think to create that Africa more than anything else, we need you business people to make it happen. We need you, the creators, the innovators, the thinkers, the change makers to ha make it happen. Because you see, through time, one thing that's certain is that economies have been built by businesses. Somehow in our part of the world, we, we, we have come to, get the, come to this expectation that governments will build our economies and our countries for us. They don't. They don't. And we'll come, but we'll come to the role of government shortly. But I want you young people to realize that actually the change and the newness of Africa that you want to see is actually in your hands. You're the ones who are going to create it. And you've seen through time that, you know, countries start and we're all in sort of huts and they make their way and they, they come up with new ideas and they work on their ideas. They work together on their ideas. And then, you know, as prosperity grows, you, you start to see services come in and more partnerships and money grows and you see more wealth created. Work product creates prosperity. Work output creates prosperity. Government alone can't do that because government can't work for all of us. 
They can't do the work that we need to do. So if we're going to be the architects of a more prosperous continent, we need to understand what's going on on this continent. We need to have relevant numbers at our fingertips so that as we plan our businesses and think of how we're going to make them grow and move them to uh, provide services on a much larger scale, how do we actually fit into the bigger picture? And that's why we need a very, very clear understanding of the numbers. Now, when you walk away from here, I want you to go away and think about the numbers, the big numbers that are relevant to your business. Not just the idea that you have, but the numbers that impact your decisions and your choices. So let's take a look at a, a few numbers from Ghana, because at least we're here and we, we understand, we feel what goes on around us. If you look across here, um, every year here what we've listed is um, Ghana's GDP in dollar terms, billion dollars, billions of dollars, sources um, the, tra the trading economics um, um, page um, on Ghana and GDP growth. And as you can see, we had a really nice boom time, nice um, steady growth. And um, in the last couple of years, things have slowed down a bit. And you start to see that slow down again when you actually look at, you know, percentage-wise growth figures. So 2015, we saw um, a growth of, you know, 3.9%. 2016, 4.1%. If you take the average, though, for the last 16 years, our country has grown for, 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 by 6.8%. And I show you these numbers because as a business person, your output affects that growth in GDP. But of course, the external factors around policy and services uh, that are, the nation provides are required, but your output pushes that number up or down. When things are going well with you in a, as a business community, our GDP grows. When they're not, then it slows down. So GDP is one example, GDP per capita, population growth trends, the changing shape of, of the nations. We talk about Africa as a whole, and I'm sure many of you here know that there are a billion of us in sub-Saharan Africa. I hope you know that. Yeah? A billion of us. In 35 years, there'll be 2 billion of us. So the businesses you are creating today in one generation could become the businesses that transform a continent. Can you imagine that? One generation isn't a long time. You know, I'm a, a little over a generation old, but it's still within my lifetime. And when I think about it, I think about it and realize that in 35 years, the majority of you in this room, or pretty much all of you, will not be classed as old. You still won't be old people. And before you're old, there'll be a billion more Africans. So the question is, that build, business you're building today, is it going to grow with those people? Or is it going to be crushed and trampled upon by the weight of those people? Let me show you some other figures from Ghana. This is the split high-level split of our, 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 our economy and the contributors to um, our economy. So here's 2013, 2014, and 2015. And when you look at those figures, I think the most interesting thing is that you see that services continue to grow and it grow in terms of their share, which means that their absolute growth is outstripping the absolute growth of all the other three sectors, agriculture and industry. Now, industry tends to refer to sort of manufacturing and so on. And on the one hand, you and I can look at this as an example and say, oh, it's great. The service sector is growing. We're doing really well. But actually, it's worrying that the other two are not keeping up. And I tell you why. First of all, the majority of our population is engaged in agriculture. The majority of the human beings in Ghana are engaged in ag agriculture. I think the estimate is somewhere around 60%, if not a little higher than that. So think about it. 60% of your human capital is producing 
at best 20% of your output. I don't think we need to be mathematicians to realize that that equation isn't right. Right? So as business people, what are we going to do to make sure that that output from an agricultural sector that is taking up 60% of our manpower at least produces more? Another worrying one, industry. For me, industry is a proxy for how much we are making things. Are we making things? Right? Are we making things that require some industrial might, some industrial thinking? Um, are we making things that, pro that serve people, not just services of, you know, uh, uh, giving people service, but, but actual making things? You know, to be industrialized, you have to make things. How many people here have thought about the equipment in their homes and wondered how much of that is made here? Right? And I'm willing to guess that at least 80% of the things in your home are probably not made here. 90? There you go. So, so this is a significant amount of your outlay, right? Because these, these goods tend to be expensive. They're supposed to last a number of years, but they tend to be expensive. But the fact that they're not made here means that that money that you spent is not contributing here. Right? So again, as business people, we are increasingly becoming skewed towards services. Um, because in the millennial age, we talk about startups and we talk about, you know, um, internet-based companies, which are great. I really think we need to stay part of the information age and, and, and you know, make, drive Ghana with the rest of the world. But we still have these gaps that we need to fill. And we still need our young minds and brains to think about how do we make these other sectors that are necessary for the progress and the prosperity of our people work. So that's some, 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 the, the, that, that's some talk around numbers. The numbers that you need to look at are much more than this. But you have to build your business with numbers. You have to be able to make decision-making a numbers game, a numbers process right from the start, even when your business is small. Because you need those numbers to help you eventually build the scale that you need. So we've talked a bit about the shape of business. And one of the things that um, I find really interesting when I engage young people on business repeatedly is that they tend to talk about the role of government a lot. Who here thinks about the role of government in their business success? But what I, what I found intriguing is how they discuss the role of government. So... I'm going to make a statement around what I've heard, and you can raise your hands if you've heard the same, or you believe the same, or you think the same. No one's recording you, so you're fine. So typically, I hear young people say the role of government is about political alignment, that they have to align to one party side or another, or one thinking side or, or another, to make their businesses successful. Really interesting. The majority of you are smiling, raising your hands, nodding your heads. And that is a fundamental issue. It's a fundamental issue. Because if, if I said to my child that, you know, you're going to school, you're, you're in education, but just because you're my child, you're going to do well. What do you think they'll do? Not a lot, really. They'll just show up to the exam and say, well, Mr. Examiner, this is my name and this is who I am and just give me my grade and let me go. And that's what happens when business people think that alignment is what they need to be successful. They don't actually demand the real things they need to be successful and their, 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 their creativity and their innovation is stifled. 
Remember the child example? He's not going to do any work because there's no need to do any work. He just has to know the right mother. But life doesn't work like that. And what I'd like to see is increasingly that our young people will re-visualize what that role and stake of government is for their business. Because increasingly, it is your voice, your vote, your opinion that's going to matter. And to be successful in business, it should be independent of who's running the country. It has to be about your ingenuity, your efficiency, your, 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 uh, your can-do attitude. But there are things that we need from our governments to be successful. And these are the things that young people should be thinking about. What you should be thinking about is, do we have the right policies for my business? What are the policies? You know, we, I meet business people all the time. They're, they're playing in a particular sector, and they don't actually know the policies that the country has for their sector. And we have a lot of great policies. But if you don't know them, how do you make good use of, of, of a policy? Policy is important. We have to insist on the rule of law. Things have to be done properly. As a business person, if I enter into, into a contract with someone, I need to honor it. If you enter into a contract with someone, they need to honor it. You need to understand that you have rights as a business owner. That is not because of the people you know and the people you don't know, but your rights as a legitimate business owner is that the rule of law must apply to you. And you have every right to insist that those laws are enforced and enforceable. These are the things that we should be asking for and about. Not so much to, to um, skewing our, our, our thinking towards, well, if this, these people are the ones running the country and I know Mr. One, two, three, four, five, my business will grow. Those businesses that are built that way, what happens to them? They don't outlive their alignment. They don't outlive their al alignment because the foundation of that business is built on alignment. Build, build a business that's built on strong understanding of your marketplace, your, your, your trends, your numbers. What are the policies that apply? If the policies aren't good enough, how do I influence? How do I get people who are in a similar space with the, to me to work together to influence those policy directions? How do I make sure that our contribution towards the GDP is increasingly meaningful? How do I spot opportunities? Because you see, if we're going to create prosperity in Africa, we need business, we need government, we need everyone to work together. But we have to make the right calls on each other. We have to ask each other for the right things, make the right demands of each other. Not the, um, if you're there, then I will be fine. We have to create a truly African entrepreneur, right? An entrepreneur who really understands their role as an architect of Africa's prosperity. Who here thinks they're an architect of Africa's prosperity? Which means you have to be willing to design that, that um, prosperity, mm -hmm. and you have to be willing to work on that prosperity. Live it, execute it. It's a lot to be willing to be an architect of prosperity, particularly in a continent or on a continent that's full of opportunity, but opportunity that won't come to you. You have to go out and find and grab. So what are some of the things? In entrepreneurship, I'm sure you all keep reading so many books and there's so many um, sources of information. But I think in our context, that there are three areas that are particularly important. We have problems, right? Those problems, for, in a, in a, in a, uh, to me, in a better phrase for them, is that they're challenges. They're not problems that should incapacitate us. They're challenges that require solutions. And those challenges present opportunity for business. 
But the question is, if you have grown up seeing these challenges all your life, are you accepting them as the norm? Or are you viewing them as opportunities to create solutions? So I think as a business leader, you need to be able to identify the challenges you want to resolve. And one of the examples of, of challenges um, that I always li like to use through time um, is um, Ford Motor Company, because I worked there. And when Henry Ford started thinking of um, this um, uh, car, the, the problem he identified, the challenge he identified was cars were not mass produced. Who, knew, who knows that? They weren't mass produced at all. Um, cars were exclusive. If you think some cars are exclusive today, cars were super exclusive, right? Um, and the people who came up with the car, bless them, they didn't try to get the horse and the cart to move faster. They, they, they industrialized transportation, which is great. So they saw a problem that says people need to be able to move faster, and they created a car. The, 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 the solution they created still had a big flaw. And the problem with, with their, their solution was that it was too expensive. And the cost of the car was driven by how it was made. Because the, it was handmade, it was you know, customized, it was made exactly the way you wanted it. And so Henry Ford looked at it and thought, well, hang on a minute, this thing is very useful. It's a good thing. But the problem is most people can't afford it. If we're going to move forward, we need more people to access one of these. And he spent years, years, trying to perfect his car because he believed, he passionately believed that was po possible to solve that problem. And so eventually he realized that what he had to do was completely change the manufacturing process. He invented the assembly line, which is now used across so many different industries and you move things along and you make it and you cut down on variation. So he identified a problem passionately pursued uh, uh, the solution. And eventually, of course, he made profit. It's a hugely profitable uh, company. It's made, generated, you know, made so many wealthy people over time. It's an old, old company. It's trained so many people. But it started by the identification. And it may be that you are thinking or working in a sector in an area that already exists, right? He came into the car industry. He didn't invent the car. But he realized that in his context, there was a lot more the car could do. The car was not serving the mass market. The car needed to serve the mass market. And so he would leave work and go home and tinker and go back to work and come home and tinker and do it repeatedly and over and over again. So he managed to get something that worked and got people to believe him, to support him. And then money comes. So your business can't start from here. It can't start from profit. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you need to identify whether it is an identified need or it's a latent need that people don't know they have yet. You need to identify it and passionately pursue it because you want to build a sustainable business. You want a business that's, that's, that's different. If, we, if we're going to create prosperity, especially for that additional billion who are coming, then we need to change the way we do business. We need to completely change the way we do business. We need to think about business differently, completely differently. You know, too often, we create businesses for ourselves. Who knows of a business that exists for the creator of the business? You don't? You don't know any? He does. We create businesses that are for ourselves. And when I say for ourselves, maybe our wife and children, our husband and children, but it's for us, for our, for our unit. The business is for us. We need to be able to create businesses. Your business has to create wealth that will go beyond you. Which means that if your business is sustainable and it's riding on a real solution that you are providing... The wealth it will create has to be more than what you and your immediate family can consume. It means that that business has to be able to employ people. It has to bring benefits to people. It has to create benefit for society. 
The wealth of your business in your thinking, you must visualize it beyond yourself. We also need our businesses to cross boundaries now. Many people write uh, that they have a business that says something, something Ghana or something, something Africa. And it exists in a suburb of Accra. I'm sorry, but a suburb of Accra is not Ghana. You can't even call that Accra. If your business only serves a suburb of Accra, it's not even Accra. It's your suburb. Right? So stop this. And then something, something, Africa. And then the only presence is in Odoko. I mean, people. It's great to have ambition and say your business is going to serve Africa, but make it serve Africa. Don't make it serve 100, 100 people and go around telling everybody it's Africa's blah, 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 blah. Africa needs more from you than that. Africa needs you as a young business person to be thinking, how is my business going to serve the first million people? And how am I going to get to my 27 million? And how am I going to get to my 330 million? And how am I going to get to my billion? Because your first million is probably within your, your, your region in Ghana. Your 27 million takes you to the whole of Ghana. Your 330 million takes you to West Africa. Your billion takes you to Africa. So before you start calling your business Africa, think about what it means. That's a heavy word, and we throw it around too easily. We need to respect that word more. There's a lot more to it. And so if you want a business that's going to serve Africa, you need to be thinking about how your business is going to survive you. I once watched a program where a Native American was building a monument to Native American history. And it was absolutely a fascinating experience because as he was built, it was a huge monument. I can't actually remember what it looked like, but it was a huge monument. And in this program, he had already recruited his son who was working with him on the, on the monument. And when he was asked why the, he already had involved his son. Do you know what he said? And I know for most of us around here, if you say that, someone will say, oh, why, you want me to die? But he said that the scale of the monument and the work that they had to do he, um, would, would outlive him. They won't be done with the project by the time he dies. So he was planning... For when he dies, even though he was young and he was healthy, he wasn't an old, you know, decrepit old, he was healthy. But he knew in his mind's eye that this monument for his people was bigger than him. Our businesses have to be monuments that are bigger than us, bigger than our children and their children. And that's why we struggle to have multi-country, multinational businesses. Because the business is for us. First of all, it's for us. Secondly, we like to serve the, the five houses behind our house. Um, and then we don't think about the future generations. Do you know the number of private clinics that have come up in Ghana and have died? They die with the doctor. There's a whole list. And then we reset the button. That's literally what we do. Every life produces... Luckily, we, we're very entrepreneurial, so don't get me wrong. We are an extremely entrepreneurial continent and country. I'm very proud of that. But we now have to take entrepreneurship into a whole different sp sphere if we're going to create prosperity for Africa. Because every time you build that business, and every time it dies with the founder, you're starting all over again. The knowledge, the skill, the know-how that we should be building on dies, and then we start all over again. You'll never become wealthy as a, a, or prosperous, will you? If every, every time people learn, they do, they do, they do this, they prosper, then zero. So think now already as a young entrepreneur building your business, 
How are you going to make this business su survive you? There's so many things to consider. You need all these things, but you will have to start looking at things like governance and so on, which we won't get into tonight. But if your vision already includes a new thinking on entrepreneurship that's beyond you, then you will eventually get into the space, the space of entrepreneurship. Uh, sorry. Um, in, into the space of the business outliving you. It's extremely important. You want a business that your children and your children... Look at how I mentioned Ford. Do you know how long ago he died? And yet, I think the Ford Purse family members who are still involved are probably like five generations removed from him. They build on it. Start in our area, start in our suburbs, start in our state, cover our country, go to the world. So, so we're sitting in that crowd, driving along with our, in our nice Ford car. Somebody made that happen and sustained it. What are you going to do? Who are you as an entrepreneur? Are you an entrepreneur because it was the thing to do and it was an, the best option and you thought, you know what, uh, there's nothing else to do, I'm going to be an entrepreneur? Or do you really wake up in the morning and feel driven as an entrepreneur? What do you see? When you close your eyes and you think in your mind's eye about your business and the impact it's going to make and the prosperity that it's going to create, what do you see? What's your vision for your business? Is it about you coming and going every day or there's a real vision that's driving you? And if there is a vision, I hope there is, because you've all taken the time to be here, which I truly appreciate, then it means that you should allow yourself to say, say your vision, speak it. Let it reflect in your words. Let it reflect in what you believe is possible. Say it. It may not exist, but saying it, you're calling it into being. And if you can see it and say it, you will think it. Your mindset will be driven around that future success and that future great vision uh, business that you want to see, which means your mind will work towards delivering, delivering that vision in your mind. Who are you as an entrepreneur? The prosperity creating type? The busy type, but busy just for being busy? Where do you want to stand as an entrepreneur? You need to ask yourself, these are some of the obvious things we ask. I want to be number one player in this marketplace space for this. I want to be the best, hopefully best employer. I hope some of you are planning to be a great place to work. But you have to define these things. You may not be them today, but you must define what that ambition is, that goal is, what you want your business to become. The same way we ask children, what do you want to be when you grow up? When they go to school, we ask, what does your business want to be when it grows up? You have to. What does it want to be when it grows up? Because if you can do that, then you can become your vision. You can embody your, your vision. And as you embody it, your organization follows along and takes, takes the form and shape of that vision. And then you will create greatness because we have a very clear common mission. The common mission is that now we have to be bold about Africa. We can't afford to take baby steps. And the truth is we no longer have excuses to take baby steps, right? Right? If you're sitting in Ghana and you want to collaborate with someone in Kenya, you don't need to fly to Kenya. If you want to find a partner in Namibia, you don't have to fly to Nam Namibia to find them. You may eventually want to see them, but from the start, you don't have to fly there. So we have the means. We have access to information, access to knowledge, access to thinking. We have all the means, but we need to change to really break from the past and really create. Well, you know, when, that day when people say, my business, X, Y, Z, Africa, think of it as truly African and not Odoko. <laughs> I like Odoko. I, I, I've lived in Odoko. But the point is that you get my point that we do that and then we say it's Africa. Look, guys. 
I could go on all night, but I, I want to hear from you too. So first of all, I have to say a very, very big thank you to you all for taking the time out to come here and listen and spend this time with me. Thank you to everyone who has tuned in online to hear us out as well. And I think now is our, sh our shot to keep this conversation going because I hope there are lots of things you're dying to ask me, to say, to contribute, and to make your voice heard too. Thank you. My name is Lucy Quist, and over the years I've had the privilege of spending time with many young people. And one thing I agree on with them is that they want to see a Ghana and an Africa that's different. It's what I call the bold new normal. The new normal that's bold, that has new visions of what is possible in this country and on this continent. You see, to truly change our outcomes, we need to be bold in defining those new visions of normality. We need to be bold in changing how we talk about our future. And those changes in what we say, our language, will impact our mindset. And it will make... But then you also spoke about we should think beyond make, um, baby steps, going beyond baby steps. So how do you know that, okay, I am still a baby after two years and you're not making profit? Yeah. Very good question. I think it's about the, the two things, the sector in which you operate. And the second thing is whether you can quickly identify what I would call a bread and butter, butter um, aspect of your business. Um, so let's say your business is, is, is a beauty, beauty parlor, right? And you want to invest in all you think that we should have state-of-the-art uh, masseuse and pedicures, manicures, hairstyling, so on and so forth. You, you've got this vision very clear, and you're willing to invest and put the money um, behind it. The truth of the matter is that all those services you've identified, some have um, a, a, a high demand, and some have low demand, some are for mass market, some are for high value customers, so on and so forth. So you need to identify within your business space very quickly, what can I do? And it still may take two to three years or more, but there, there's, there has to be some aspect of your business that if you push that very hard, can start to become self-sustaining. So you don't have to fulfill all the things overnight. But you have to identify the things that can become profitable quickly to sustain you so that it will help you produce the other things that may not be profitable for longer, but they're part of your vision. They're opportunities. They're problems you are, you've identified. And I think the beauty parlor example is one that we can identify with quickly because women do their hair a lot. Women get pedicures sometimes. Men get pedicures rarely Right? So you start to see your hierarchy of services that if you, if you start from the ma male pedicure business, <sighs> I have my suspicions. <laughs> so you, you get me, and that's a simple example, but hopefully in your line of business, you start to see that, that breakdown as well. I mean, you talk about Ford, but Ford sells cars, they do insurance, they do, they do so many different things now, but the baseline is we made a car, they made a car to sell. Thank you. Good evening. Um, yeah, David. Okay. Um, in Africa, we've observed that um, a lot of entrepreneurs want to start new business, but human resource is a challenge in terms of getting the right skills of people to support to get the job done. How do we rally our population so people begin to understand that the business is not only for the the entrepreneur who started it, but it's for the entire uh, ecosystem. Mm. Excellent question. And again, I, I have to qualify this. So tonight my responses are about the businesses of the future, right? I'm here because I believe that you are the businesses of the future. You're going to create the prosperous Africa. So it's not about the past, but about the future. I think the first thing is that you have to embody the values you expect. It starts with you. If people can see in you somebody who is 
hungry to grow, who is thirsty, who seeks out knowledge, who improves upon himself, it will be evident because, you know, we keep company with like-minded people and we adjust it according to who we're associating with. So first of all, it starts with you. Um, secondly, believe in the people. If you embody the right values and you believe in them, they will start to live it. Because you see, human capacity and, and, and potential has actually been proven to be evenly distributed. So it's not like some continents got a higher proportion of intelligence than others. It's a normal distribution, right? The, the challenge is that you have a, a systemic issue around you that creates situations where, uh, whereby people think it's okay not to strive. And the fact that, uh, um, sorry, I, I take the back, they, they, they don't want to strive sometimes, but also sometimes people have a challenge with what I call what good looks like. Right? It's about um, you know, local champion. They feel they're great. It's up to you to set the standard and the tone that demonstrates to them that you're, you're good, but you're not great yet. And you need to stretch. In this organization, great doesn't look like what you look like today. It requires us to be some, do some work. So I state it, but it, I know it's not easy, and it's not just I, I say this and it happens. Um, but as a business owner and leader, you have to be willing to make the painstaking effort to make it happen. Because people do change, and people do adapt. And what you find is that in time, and it won't be a long time, actually. I've, I've found that that ad adaptation doesn't take that long, as long as you're consistent. You see, people are waiting for you to do it for, for three months and give up. But if they get to three months, oh, my goodness, he's still at it. <laughs> All right, I'll read another book and we'll have a discussion. They start to understand that this is how I operate. So you're either going to operate like this and be with me or you can't be with me. And stick with it because we need to create a generation that thinks and behaves differently. And as I said earlier, business does that because we reach far more people than anywhere, anyone else. If we can inculcate in our businesses the right behaviors and attitudes, we will affect society. Oh, hi, Lucy. Hi. Um, my name is Vanessa, and I'm based in the UK, but I'm sort of part of the African diaspora who wants to move back um, to Africa. And I've got a business in the UK, it's a social enterprise. So um, I've got the kind of the problem and the passion, and what I do is I work a lot with businesses and consult them on how they can recruit more women, especially telecoms businesses. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, okay, I wanna move to Ghana. Do I bring my business here or do I get a job? Now, whilst I was doing some research, what mm -hmm. the difficulty that I have, and I wanted to kind of get some advice is about businesses that have a, a social purpose. In the UK, there's a lot of government legislation about you know businesses doing good but in Ghana it doesn't seem that you've got the kind of government support on businesses so companies don't necessarily have the big budgets that they have in the UK so I just wanted to kind of get your advice on if you're a social enter enter um, enterprise and you're a kind of someone like me trying to come back to Ghana and you want to be sustainable as a business sort of where do you start because that, that's the kind of trouble that I'm having I don't want to give up but I also want to kind of be sensible and think okay you know what's the best choice to make Good question. So that's quite, quite kind of, I, I think there are at least two questions in there. First of all, the whole idea of moving to another place is challenging. It's, you know, no one should take it for granted. Wherever you're moving to, whether you, you were moving to Portugal, wherever you were moving to, it would be challenging. I think sometimes when people are moving to Africa, there's this fundamental, any country in Africa, assumption that, oh, I'm from Africa, so, you know, I'll get there and everything will be fine and, you know, I'll just solve all the problems and, hey will be cool, right? And it doesn't work like that because the context is, is unique. Every context is unique. And interestingly, the people in the, within the context understand it best of all. So I would always advise that for, for moving, you need to find the right cohort group of people to associate with. Not people who are all like you, who are just moved, but people who actually know what goes on here. Very important. Um, so consider that. You know, you saw my part about policy. You're right, we don't have all the policies that support um, so social entrepreneurship because we're emerging. We're trying to create this wealthy um, place called Ghana, called Africa, where, gov where companies will give you that. So I think the real challenge for you is how would you restructure your business model for this space? That's the key. 
It's about restructuring. It's not that the, the business idea is not relevant, but you see how, guys, we talked about taking your business outside of Ghana to other countries. If you go from um, Ghana to Cameroon, you can't assume that it's just going to work. In fact, most people go and find it doesn't, right? Um, or you go from Ghana to South Africa. Yeah, we're all on the continent, but hey, we have different approaches. So your big, your big thing, your big challenge is, how do I adapt my business model to suit? And it may be that that adaptation may be that you have to start showing interest in other areas of social entrepreneurship. Because if your fundamental passion is so, social entrepreneurship around solving problems, then does it always have to be only women? Right? It may be that in the context where you are now, the biggest inter uh, social uh, intervention from a social enterprise point of view needed is about getting more women involved. Maybe here it's something different. But the thinking that you have there is still useful. So think about how you will adapt as a person and think about how you adapt your business model to also suit the context of Ghana. Does that help? You're welcome. Hi. Hello. You spoke about how entrepreneurs should think about the role of governments. Yes. Exactly. So I'd like to know how we as startups or how we as entrepreneurs can make the governments appreciate the problems that we are facing and how we can also help in drive policy. You know, when it comes to the big corporations, they have um, lobbyists who drive those policies and stuff. But when it comes to us, how can we contribute or how can we make the government know that these are some of the issues that we are facing? And yeah. Brilliant question. Because, you know, one of the things that I identify in terms of our gaps for, for future businesses like you is that we don't have enough policies that actually gear towards future business. Do you know this? We don't. And you know why? Because if you're waiting for me to do it, I won't. That makes you feel uneasy. But I meant that in all, all, all seriousness. What it is is that people who are already further along in their, whether it's their career or their business, invariably focus more on the area they know, right? I won't do it because I probably don't understand your business space very well. Now, I have enough humility to know that there are many things I don't know. So what's my point? More people like you who are in a similar space, adjacent space, need to work together and make their voices heard. You may think that big companies have um, voices, but most of them don't have more than one person speaking for them, seriously, at any given, given time. Imagine if 2,000 young startup companies in a specific space came together and said, we've gone through the policy based on these trends and data analytics that we have. These are the policy changes that we see need necessary. Do you think someone will listen? They'll be forced to, absolutely. They'll be forced to. The, 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 the thing is that because so many of our young people have understood uh, our, our democracy from a business point of view to mean alignment, we forgo the real work of democracy, which is about driving the voice of the people. That's actually what it's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be that if the majority of us agree on something, it's required to happen. Our agreement is more important to our progress, our development, than our choosing sides. Because that agreement and that policy, it outlives whoever's in charge. And if your business is going to outlive whoever's in charge, then you need policies that support you. So what you need is to form more collabor uh, collaborative partnerships. You don't have to work with the person in business. You just have to be able to agree on the things you're going to drive together. I've come to Workshed. I see lots of people, young people here coming here to work and work together. There are different you know, young groups of young people starting up businesses in new sectors that many of us aren't familiar with. You are the ones who should be telling us. You know, I read things about like Bitcoin and blockchain and blah, blah, blah. Do I understand? No. Do I suspect that we need some policies for them? I have a feeling we do. 
But those of you who get it, you're the ones who are going to have to demand those changes. What laws do we need for Bitcoin? I don't know. Yes. This is the case where some of us don't even know our members of parliament. And even getting access to them alone, it's, it's, it's hectic. It's not. <laughs> They're all on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. <laughs> it's not that hectic. And you know, we're all trying to survive with our business. It's trying to don't run survive. Our don't exactly. survive. Go have big plans. Yes. And having to have the time and resource to chase those policies alone. It's 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 kind of hard, you know, not having any back. Have you ever tried? Uh, no, I haven't. So you don't know that for a fact. <laughs> it's not hard. No, you see, this is the thing. It's back to the point you, you, he, um, he made. The point he was making was around, you know, people come in and they think like this and they behave like this. Then how do I get them along the journey? We've been told the narrative re repeatedly that we're helpless. We can't affect change. Our voice doesn't matter. Our influence won't do anything for people. It does. Because we're fundamentally democratic. But people, again, I emphasize, think that that then means choose sides. That's not what democracy means. It means that if 2,000 of you show up, or even, even if it's 100 of you who have a valid point that the rest of us don't know anything about, we have to listen to you. Those MPs, they're all on social media. I'm telling you, have you ever had somebody badger you on social media? Yes, I have. You, did you ignore them? No, I you didn't. couldn't. I'm telling you. You are the generation that actually shouldn't say it's difficult. Look, today, if you wanted to get under Donald Trump's skin, you could. You know that. Yes. All you have to do is send out the right tweet. And he'll respond. Come on, people. For your generation, it's not about doors anymore. It's not about doors. Use that power. Use that power that you have. It's a new form of access. And the old business people, they don't know it. The new business people, they've got it. Find out who your MP is. I can bet you they're on social media, wherever you are in the country. Find like-minded people. If you can't find them physically, find them on social media. Guys, I'm working on X, Y, Z, and I looked through the policy document, and I realized that there's nothing that supports this new area that I've, I, I've come up with. And I've done some research, and when I looked at um, Korea, and then I looked at Rwanda, I think these are the things we should do, and we can improve on that. Then you're really exercising your democratic right as a business person. It's not about voting day. It's about driving the country that you want to see created. I'm not a politician. I'm not talking politics. Politics is very different from your right to actually create prosperity through a playing field that's open for everyone. That's what we're talking about. Hi. Hello. I'm Dennis. Hi, Dennis. Um, you have said that there is the need for us to create businesses beyond ourselves. Yes. Businesses that cross boundaries. Now, this morning, some of us were in a session like this with the CEO of Bridge Group, mm -hmm. Mr. Mike Nyenaku. Mm -hmm. And there he made an interesting revelation about a recent research report mm -hmm. he read. And then the report was about the top 500 companies that are pushing wheels and driving impacts over the years in Africa. And then out of these 500, only three were Ghanaian companies. Out of these three, two were state-owned, and just one was a private company, which is very disappointing. Now, my question is that how do we sustain businesses that create a transgenerational value? How do we create the likes of the JP Morgans and then the Goldman Sachs that have outlived they are founders for 100 years and over now. So my main emphasis is on the how. Well, I talked about the how. You may have missed it, but I'll repeat it. You see, the business has to have a vision that's bigger than you. And that great vision will create wealth and prosperity, but it also has to be wealth and prosperity that's beyond you. 
And if you're going to create wealth and prosperity that's beyond you, then surely you can't just be thinking of, you know, your suburb in Accra. You need to think geographically um, uh, in, in big terms. But if you're going to think geographically big, then you need structures in place. You know, that's where I mentioned governance. When you think big, you think structure. If your business is manageable within the span of your arms, it's not going to go anywhere beyond you. If you can really control everything in your business directly every single day, that's not going to go transgenerational or multi-country. That's a business for you. You need a business that's bigger than you, that creates wealth for more than you, that crosses boundaries, and that outlives you. Because, you, right, all the examples that you give, um, you, you gave, don't have founders who are alive. Right? But if you have the right structures in place, then you start to think about, okay, if I want to go abroad, maybe I need a partner. Maybe I need investors. Maybe I need other kinds of expertise. Maybe I need people who will have a different point of view, but I'll listen to them. But it starts with the vision. Because if your vision and goal is to go that far, then operationally you will do all the other things that you need to get it that far. So it's a great insight that he shared for you. And this is our problem. Because when you're not creating com companies across um, um, boundaries, across countries, and across generations, you're not creating sustainable prosperity. What you're doing is creating wealth for yourself. And remember, I talked about the, the, the clinics are my big example because there's so many of them. You see the name. Oh, Dr. So-and-so, he was a very good doctor. La, 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 Great example. We've had entrepreneurs. We didn't start being entrepreneurs in your generation. We've done it for ages. But it happens. It happens. And the next generation isn't prepared for the business. And so what happens then is that the founder dies and it's all torn apart. And we go back to square one until somebody else comes up with that idea again. Okay, we have one more question. Then I guess I'm the last. <laughs> okay, my name is Harrison. Hi, Harrison. Yeah. And yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, how, as a business, how do you know the right moment to move the next step? We talk about crossing boundaries, but we've realized there are some businesses that uh, they didn't take opportunity of uh, maybe new technologies. They were still hanging on, like the time for them to move the next step, they didn't move, or some two moved too early, and then uh, they cried. As a business, how do you know, let's say you are a community business, how do you know, okay, it's time for me to go national, it's time for me to maybe go continental, how do you... Uh, how do you know? Okay, so first of all, do you, is it something you even want? That's the fundamental starting point. Well, that's why I will always harp on about vision. Is it something you even want? Because if it's something you want, it will be on your radar, right? It will be something you're looking out for. It will be a case of, I talked about stats and numbers, right? If you want to identify a country to go to, do you want to, the to go to the country where it's projected to see um, a decline in GDP for the next five years or the one where it's going to grow for the next five years, right? But if you don't check the numbers, how are you going to know? Right? Oh, I feel like going to there. Right? You need numbers. We need to become, you know, more savvy with the numbers. What are the numbers that are relevant to your market, your business? Right? If, if, if someone says that, you know, I'm into rice production and I hear that the number of Togolese eating rice is set to grow 10% year on year, start rubbing your hands. So know what's going on. Understand the trends. The trends will be your guide, but also your business needs to be ready. So if today you're serving, you're serving a, you know, a population of 100,000 and you hear that there's a business opportunity for another 100,000, what are you going to do? Because your business cannot serve that first 100,000, that second 100,000, right? So you need to adjust your business and scale it up to serve the second 100,000. So there are indicators and ways that you know. Your, when we want to take the next step, we can't rely on emotion. 
Yes, you need ambition, confidence, drive, but you need to know the facts and figures as a business person to take your business to the next level. So, I hope that answered your question. I'm going to say thank you very much to all of you because we're going to end the live stream, but I'm still here. Thank you all very much. Wonderful evening. My name is Lucy Quith, and over the years, I've had the privilege of spending time with many young people. And one thing I agree on with them is that they want to see a Ghana and an Africa that's different. It's what I call the bold new normal. The new normal that's bold, that has new visions of what is possible in this country and on this continent. You see, to truly change our outcomes, we need to be bold in defining those new visions of normality. We need to be bold in changing how we talk about our future. And those changes in what we say, our language, will impact our mindset and will make that future possible. It's exactly why I'm embarking on a tour meeting groups of young people to talk about this bold new normal, to share ideas and to agree on what we need to do into that future. Follow me on social media and you will hear more about where these events will be, but more importantly, I will share details of when these events will be live streamed so you can participate from wherever you are. Let's come together, let's define our bold new normal and let's agree to work on creating the future that you and I know is possible. Join us.